let this be a normal field trip? With a friend? No way! Cruising on down Main Street, you're relaxed and feeling good. Next thing that you know, you see it. Ah! Octopus in the neighborhood, surfing on the sine wave, swinging through the stars. Yeah. Take a left at Joe's Tavern. Did your second right grab more from the magic school bus? Oh, Alligator, Nostrum. Climb on the magic school bus. Make a plane to the tube. Take that. I love magic school bus. Rock the river of love. Oh, oh magic school bus. Such a fine thing to do. So strap your bones back to the seat. Come on in and don't be shy. Come on. Just to make your day complete. You might get baked into a pile on the magic school bus. Step inside, it's a wild ride. Come on, ride right on the magic school bus. Welcome. I wish there was more way I could work Magic School Bus into everything I teach. Uh, welcome to week 10. This is our final week for all intents and purposes. So last week was the last part of the core um, portion of the class. Um, this week, there ha I have made some changes to the syllabus. So um, this week will be the last required video lecture presentation and reading response. Next week, I will be doing an optional lecture that you're welcome to watch and engage with um, on critical race theory. Um, I want you to have it as a tool, but um, given how hard you guys have worked this uh, this year um, and the um, that we're rapidly approaching the due date for final projects and we have the final exam, next week will be optional. Nothing will be required next week. Please take the time. Make sure you're caught up on everything. Make sure that um, you're taking care of yourself as we um, head into the final, the final sprint, if you will. Um, this week, we will be talking about court cases. We'll be, um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit why um, this week is a little bit different, um, but uh, this week's reading response will be a little bit lighter. I'll have a little bit different expectations for it, um, but we'll also talk about why I want wanted to make sure that you guys had this week as well. So let's talk a little bit about this presentation or this uh, article here before we get started. So this was a simple one from Chalkbeat. We got the first report from the state um, regarding high school uh, pre uh, preparedness and engagement with college courses post-graduation. Um, and unsurprisingly, we saw an effect from the pandemic on, stu uh, on students going to college. Um, that is not shocking. Um, what I think the larger concern is that I highlighted earlier is that, um, or not larger concern, the, uh, the, the larger thing we should keep in mind here is that the in terms of the career education and the, the career readiness programs in high schools, that rate didn't really change. And I think that's um, very impactful that shows that students are understanding that that education is important and that it sets them up for a career well but i think that they're seeing less and less of a justification in going to college right away um which i think will have um large implications for our higher education going forward so let's talk about the courts here let me make sure my recording's going we're good to go we are that'd be awkward if it wasn't at this point so, let's talk a little bit about the courts. So, why I want you guys to have this week. So, we um, earlier this year, we read some bill texts. Bill texts is awful to read. Um, I would read court cases all day over bill texts, but it's important as policy analysts, as administrative professionals, that we understand how to read bill texts. The same thing is true for court cases. Um, unfortunately, um, court cases become a huge part of our life, especially within education policy, because we have to understand what the courts are doing because it has a large impact on what we're able to do as administrators, and also what policymakers are able and willing to do um, for education overall. So this week we're going to talk about the historic role of the courts, and then we're going to talk about three and a half different court cases. We're going to talk about Brown v. Board, and then the half is Brown 2, which we'll talk about. We're going to talk about San Antonio v. Rodriguez, and we're going to talk about Fisher v. Texas. Um, I do want you guys to, to take some time to read the court cases, but as we'll talk about, it is not super important that you understand everything in the court cases. Instead, it's really important for you to understand, A, what the central argument is in that court case, and B, 
what is the rhetoric they're, they're using? How is it being presented? Because that has a huge impact on how the court case is interpreted. And then the reading response will be light. It'll be just one court case. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. All right. So let's talk about the torts a little bit. Um, if you aren't familiar with the torts, that's okay. This is not a law school, um, nor would I want it to be. Um, but let's, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a refresher on how the tort system works in the United States. So with federal courts, there are three different levels. There's the district courts, there's the appellate courts, or the appeal tor appeals courts, and then there's the Supreme Court. If you want to challenge something through the U.S. Constitution, you have to take it to the district court first. Um, if whoever loses that case in district court disagrees they have the right to appeal it to the appellate courts which will review the decisions of the district courts if whoever loses at the appellate court level um wishes to uh, appeal it further they can appeal to the supreme court who has the final determination on constitutional issues we'll talk about why that's a little bit different in a, in a second but um state courts are the same thing um district courts uh, state district courts are the first level then there's the state appellate courts and then there's the state supreme courts the only difference is that the state supreme court will make a ruling, it's not necessarily final if there's a constitutional issue involved. It can be appealed straight to the uh, Supreme Court. So we're gonna talk about mainly this week about constitutional reviews. So this is the idea that someone is harmed in some way that affects their constitutional rights. We have a ton of constitutional rights to outline. We've got the, the real famous ones, the, the freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of uh, uh, right to bear arms, uh, of course, we can't court, or we can't be forced to quarter soldiers. All of these really important rights. Um, and so, the way that a constitutional review works is that something happens. I feel like my constitutional rights have been harmed. So, um, I will file suit as the claimant. I file suit in saying what part of the constitution, or what part of my constitutional rights was violated. The district court will then hear the case and make a ruling. Um, Let's say I win the district court case. I'm like, sweet, game over, I'm good to go. But whoever I was uh, filing the suit against has the right to appeal it. Same thing goes if I ended up losing the case, I can appeal it to the appellate courts or the appeals courts. Um, they will then make a judgment on the lower court's read, uh, ruling, either agreeing with or disagreeing with the lower court's ruling. The same thing occurs here. Whoever loses can then appeal it to the Supreme Court. The alternate path that you can take is that a state constitutional issue, so remember state constitutions are separate from the U.S. Constitution, so a state constitutional issue can be violated and you can take it through the state courts. The only other way a, a court case can end up at the Supreme Court is if a state Supreme Court rules something and there is a further issue that is larger about a u.s constitutional issue that then the supreme court will then have to resolve um there are this is an important thing that i think i i like geeking out about everything government i i'm on a particular supreme court kit lately um there are thousands of cases that are appealed to the supreme court every year um however the supreme court cannot hear all of them so they have to go through the process of granting cert what that means is um it's granting the writ of certiorari certiorari yeah that's it um essentially saying this is something we want to hear and make a ruling on um again there are many cases in which they are not granted cert what generally happens if your case is not granted cert is that whatever the last decision that was made, whether it was the state Supreme Court or the appellate court, then stands. Um, the only difference is that if it's not granted cert, theoretically the case can come back before the Supreme Court. It's not a final decision. Um, there's a lot of nuance to that, but in general, if the Supreme Court does not grant cert, whatever the previous court said generally stands. Um, we're going to be talking exclusively about Supreme Court issues, but I think that's an important nuance to have. Um, once the Supreme Court makes a ruling, that's final. It's done. There is no further way to appeal. If you lose at the Supreme Court, you're done. Um, you cannot take it back to the district court. You cannot hear that case again. It is over. Um, this is um, 
part of the reason why the Supreme Court will sometimes say, yeah, we're not making a decision. They'll hear an entire case and they'll, they'll just refer it back to the lower courts. Um, that allows it, just like not granting cert, to theoretically come back before them at a later time. It gives them a little bit of protection if there's an issue that they don't really want to address, but they know that that issue is important to be heard right away. Um, Supreme Court rulings do have the force of law. However, remember that law is a social contract, a contract, right? If the other governmental actors and other courts choose not to enforce SCOTUS rulings, there's not really a recourse built into the system. This is one of the big loopholes within our constitutional system that um, there is no check or balance for if people just choose not to listen to the Supreme Court. Um, this has happened a couple of times in our um, nation's history. Happened Andrew Jackson um, famously said, you and what army, when the Supreme Court threatened to rule against him um, with the Indian Removal Acts. Um, the, there were a number of different issues with the Civil War that um, certain states were choosing not to not to follow the the rulings of the Supreme Court regarding um, emancipation, slavery, that sort of stuff. Um, and then um, Brown v. Board, which we'll talk about here in a second, presented another constitutional crisis in which Southern states just decided that whatever the Supreme Court said in Brown v. Board did not have the force of law. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's important. And I think that um, you know this is not a course about um, you know, civil rights directly um, or, you know, um, the rights of women, bodily autonomy, constitutional rights. But I do think that the recent ruling in Dobbs, which overturned Roe v. Wade, has the potential to become another constitutional crisis if, if there becomes a disparate impact of what that ruling means from state to state to state. So it's important to remember that Yes, what the Supreme Court is uh, is says is final, and 99% of the time it goes off without a hitch. But every once in a while, if the ruling is controversial enough, um, there there can be issues with choosing whether or not to enforce it. With education specifically, the courts don't touch education policy directly. Remember, education is not in the Constitution, therefore there's not really an avenue for us to say, hey, this is a bad education policy, we need to change it, because there's not a constitutional right to education, which we'll talk about in San Antonio. But the way that the court gets around that is by invoking the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment um, famously has the Equal Protection Clause seen here. The Equal Protection Clause essentially says that the United States, nor shall any state, um, shall not deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection under the law. Um, very simple, very straightforward. Um, the application of the Equal Protection Clause is part and parcel with education equity issues. There are some legal scholars, especially some education sto uh, legal scholars, that argue that the Equal Protection Clause didn't exist until the ruling in Brown v. Board because that was the first time in which it was truly applied. The courts, once they made their ruling in Brown v. Board, they seem to be taking a pretty active role in enforcing equal protection in educational institutions. However, as we're going to talk about, the court has done nothing but roll back its, its role, its purpose in education. The rulings in both San Antonio and Fisher, which we're going to talk about, have lessened the role that the courts play in educational equity. So. What I want you to be thinking about as we talk about this is what impact do court rulings have on policy agendas and what impact do court rulings have on bureaucratic action, those actions of the administrators and the teachers? What could the ruling mean in the classroom like we've done this entire time? What does it all boil down to for students and for teachers? So let's start with talking about Brown v. Board. Brown v. Board might be the most famous um, Supreme Court case ever. Um, we're going to talk about these Supreme Court cases in three different buckets. We're going to talk about the fa facts of the case, which is basically why this became an issue in the first place. We're going to talk about the considerations, which is what the Supreme Court, what the justices are looking at, what they're considering 
as the constitutional issue, we're going to talk about the ruling itself as well. And that's where we can start thinking about, okay, what is that impact on policy agendas and on uh, bureaucrats? So Brown v. Board, facts of the case. So Brown v. Board was named after Oliver Brown. The actual um, text says it's Brown et al. versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Um, but, um, you know, it's named after Oliver Brown and his concerns with his daughter not being able to get into a school because of the uh, Topeka, Kansas' segregation rules. It was actually a consolidation of a bunch of different cases brought that were basically about the same thing, about minority students being denied entry to certain public schools because of their race, because of these laws, these Jim Crow laws that, per, uh, that enforced segregation. Um, this, all of these laws had been in existence at this point in the 1950s for more than five decades, and they were all upheld under the ruling of Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy um, was ruled in 1896. It is largely, it is um, pretty widely considered to be one of the worst court rulings in American history. But essentially what it said is that the issue was that um, James Plessy was um, challenging a rule in which there were separate rail cars for both black and white individuals. Um, the court famously said that equal protection can be in place in a segregated society because separate but equal facilities were legal. This was the separate but equal doctrine that allowed for, among all of these different institutional segregations, um, schools to continue to be segregated and for that to have the force of law. So the considerations that the court was looking for here, um, the, the, the claimants, Brown et al., were represented by Thurgood Marshall, who later became a Supreme Court justice in his own right. Um, they essentially argued that the law should be unconstitutional because of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Um, they they essentially said um, Plessy was improperly decided. Plessy was wrong. This was an important development for this specific court because of the, pro uh, the principle of stare decisis, which is literally translated to stand by things decided. Essentially, this is cover for the Supreme Court to say, hey, we just have to listen to what the previous court says. Um, as you're going to see as a trend throughout this, and if you ever take administrative law or civil rights courses in the future, um, this is, a lot of law is just kind of agreed upon principles. Nothing's really written down, it's just essentially saying, hey, um, things like stare decisis are what we should follow. Um, so directly challenging a previous court ruling violated stare decisis because the court was then changing or uh, uh, was then directly challenging a previous court's ruling. Um, this was also a really big deal because it was one of the first major court cases to rely on social science research. Um, the research presented by Marshall and his team um, was modernized at the time social science research that said here are the effects of segregation on students well-being, on their social standing, on their educational outcomes, on their potential career earnings. All of these things that are pretty common in social science circles now um, weren't really ever heard in the Supreme Court or taken with such force before the Brown decision. Um, they used this as equal to legal decisions legal principles that would normally have dominated the conversation, this is where the Supreme Court said, you know what, this social science is important for us to hear. So as we all probably know, one of the most famous rulings ever written, um, Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote that laws enforcing separate but equal doctrine were unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. Um, the ruling was unanimous. This was a very intentional decision by the justices on the court, saying that if even one of them chose to dissent or even draw any sort of, um, any sort of contrast that may have undermined the initial argument, 
um, it would have led to a larger issue. It needed to be unanimous, according to War, War, uh, Warren and his uh, his team of justices. Um, Warren intentionally wrote this opinion, which you, you'll, you'll be reading, it is posted on Canvas, in pretty layman's terms uh, compared to other uh, legal cases at the time it's pretty easy to read and that was pretty it's uh, pretty intentional as well because he wanted there to be no way for anyone to not be able to engage with exactly what they were saying separate but equal equal was unconstitutional full stop that is what they wanted to happen this opinion had immediate consequences it led to celebrations obviously but especially in so the southern states it led to violent protests um many southern state governments chose to just ignore the ruling in brown v board they said that um the supreme court they invoked um andrew jackson and said the supreme court can enforce it with all the force of their army and um uh many southern state governors many southern legislators essentially said we don't care what they say we're going to keep enforcing segregation um this was really critical because even though um this ruling was this triumph for civil rights it revealed the the major flaw it brought this back again the major flaw in our constitutional system that if people just choose to ignore what the court says what power does it actually have or do we actually have a system that protects civil rights if a civil rights decision is just ignored by some of the states so because of this the supreme court did something that as far as i'm aware not a legal scholar but as far as i'm aware they've never done since they came back and made another ruling on the same case they did not hear more arguments they essentially said you know what since people are ignoring us we need to further clarify what we mean by the decision in brown v board so it's it's pretty colloquially called brown 2. it's very short so i didn't even assign it but essentially it all boiled down to this idea that um uh, -uh no we didn't say that it was optional for segregation to be illegal it said that um integration of schools should happen quote, with all deliberate speed. Now, there was a risk in doing this because not only did it set the precedent for the courts to say, hey, 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 no, you have to listen to us and essentially slap everyone on the hand, but it also risked causing a greater issue. There were concerns about a potential another civil war because if they go back and say again and again and again, hey, you need to enforce this and people just choose to not listen, our Supreme Court's done. It, it no longer has any power. Luckily, what ended up happening was that President Eisenhower, after Brown II, directed the National Guard to protect students attending integrated schools and to prevent the literal barring of African-American students from attending white schools. The, the executive branch said, this is the ruling of the Supreme Court and we are going to enforce it. So these southern states that were previously saying yeah the court can come with us uh, come when they have their army to come protect it well now they had an army to come enforce it and it was a violent time it was scary it was um traumatic it took years and to um multiple decades for some schools to be fully integrated but with this force um so uh, southern states were forced to listen to the ruling um again this is I, I cannot emphasize enough how wild this was courts don't the court doesn't do this it doesn't come once it meets a ruling it just lets the ruling be and the way that people um the way that it would come back and revisit a ruling is if a, another case came up through the system that questioned or challenged part of that ruling without that even happening the court said no we're we need to come back and talk about this again um this is important for us to understand because it showed that in the 1950s, this was how important integration and equality in education was to everyone in America. It was important for this to be protected. Every, all nine justices that were appointed by Republicans and Democrats alike 
said this is the central issue this is the hill that we will die on to protect equality and so um this was a, a an apex moment for equality in the classrooms um what i want you to think about then is that as administrators and as teachers what impact would this then have if you were a teacher in a formerly black school what happens to you um is there violence is there are there issues with attendance um there were a lot of practical consequences and i wish i had more time to talk about this but the fallout from this these integration rulings went far beyond just integrating schools there were mass closures of certain schools that the the reorganization of resources was hard to do and it led to a lot of inequities in the distribution of resources in and of itself busing was a direct fallout from the brown decision um because you know, like we've talked about, people self-sort. White people tend to live with white, uh, white people and um, uh, African Americans, minorities, because of government policies, because of socioeconomic issues, tend to be sorted into low-income areas that were majority minority. And so trying to get the integration to happen was geographically difficult. And so there were uh, novel policies about um, forced busing uh, to take white students to formerly black schools and take black students to formerly white schools to force that integration that caused a huge um, a, a lot of uh, a lot of problems a lot of um, protests violence um, uh, against the students against the schools um, and there were a lot of practical issues that had to be contended with at that point but it was such a big issue for the supreme court that they said we unanimously and ve vehemently s are telling you that this is central to what we need to do so with that ruling with those rulings i should say um we get about two decades of us trying to figure out what this new world looks like um, policymakers have to contend with this ruling. Whether or not you agreed at the time with the ruling in Brown, if you didn't agree, uh, if you if you chose to ignore it, the the National Guard was going to come and um, you know enforce it regardless. You had to you had to deal with it. And so um, this next case that we're going to talk about was one of the direct results of the Brown v. Board decision. So uh, again, hot button issue. Courts over and over again are saying these busing regimes are required. Um, we need to continue to reject any sort of um, bylaw segregation. Um, one response that the state of Texas had was they set a minimum funding threshold for all schools. This is actually pretty common for states. Colorado has it in Amendment 20. Um, essentially says, um, hey, no matter where your school is located, the state will supplement you up to a certain minimum threshold that you need to be able to function. Um, whether or not that actually gets enforced, Colorado hasn't enforced it in a while, um, is different. But the state set out these, um, these funding schemes um, that said the state will fund the minimum threshold. The rest of the funding came from local property tax. Sounds pretty familiar. We've talked a lot about this, right? This was a scheme that was novel. Um, at the time, but they needed to figure out a way to ensure equal funding without, you know, further upsetting the 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 wealthy white schools. So the scheme that Texas came up with was, you know, the state does this minimum threshold, everything else comes from property tax. Rodriguez um, represented a number of impoverished, largely Mexican American students from the Edgewood neighborhood in San Antonio, Texas. Um, in the case, they argued that, hey, um, these students in Edgewood, in the same district, in the same city, are receiving about 10% of the local funding that students in Alamo Heights, which is a wealthy white neighborhood in San Antonio, were receiving because of this local property tax scheme. Rodriguez essentially said, basing school funding on property tax is a violation of the 14th Amendment because it inherently gave an advantage to socioeconomically benefited or a social a socioeconomically wealthy schools districts and neighborhoods the court then had to contend with 
okay, how far does the equal protection ruling go? Obviously, laws that explicitly said, hey, black students and white students need to be in separate schools, that's not okay. We, we agree on that, right? But what about funding? What about socioeconomic status? What about something that maybe is, has the effect of inequality, but is not intentionally unequal? So the Supreme Court chose to look at it under what's called the strict scrutiny doctrine. Strict scrutiny is the highest level, the highest legal standard the court can apply. There's a bunch of different legal standards for our purposes. Strict scrutiny essentially says that the government needs to demonstrate that there is a compelling interest in them taking on the specific policy that they are taking on. Um, so in this case, Rodriguez asked them to say, okay, is there a compelling government interest in funding schools through local property tax? And could that be accomplished in any other way that would present less inequality? Um, again, similar funding schemes uh, uh, existed outside of Texas. This, just cho uh, this was just the one that ended up in the, uh, in the Supreme Court. And um, this was going to have ramifications no matter how it was decided. Um, because every state was trying to contend with how they deal with these new issues. The ruling was 5-4, so pretty much the exact opposite of the Brown ruling. It was very divided and very contentious. Essentially, um, in the 5-4 ruling, the majority, uh, uh, majority opinion, opinion delivered by Justice Powell wrote that they were not going to apply strict scrutiny to Texas funding regime because the Constitution did not guarantee a right to education. To break that down in a, in a simpler form, essentially what the court said was um, strict scrutiny only applies when you're violating a constitutional right, and guess what? Education isn't a constitutional right. Um, that was a bit of a, as big of a deal as it, as it could have been um, on its own, it became a way bigger problem um, when this court started talking about why they didn't think that this was applied. So remember I mentioned that this is talking about how far the equal protection rights go. Essentially what the court said is that because the funding regime of property taxes did not, quote, systematically discriminate against all poor people, it was also not so irrational as, as to be individually discriminatory. Simply because the purpose of the funding system was not to discriminate, it was not discriminatory. Because education is not a constitutional right. The court took a kneecap to its own power that it had given itself under Brown. Because now what they said was that they were only able to review laws that directly addressed racial discrimination. They were not going to take on issues that were not intended or explicitly intended to be racially discriminatory. This was huge. Think about what this means. This essentially said that if the lawmakers could justify that, oh no, they're not intending to discriminate against people, it just has the effect of discriminating against people, those education laws would stand no matter what. This is, and I do not exaggerate, this is the root of most of our in, uh, inequality issues in education to this day. Because this funding scheme was allowed Every state now has this funding scheme. Every school is funded by local property tax, and therefore we end up in a system in which areas with higher property values have more money for their education. I do wanna note that the court later revisited this specific funding scheme and ruled that the, 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 the specific regime that the Texas um, legislature had put into place was constitutional, but the reason why this doesn't have much of an impact, they didn't overturn this ruling, is because they didn't say, oh, 
we're, we're completely changing our opinion. They just essentially said, oh, well, this specific regime in Texas had this specific language did not serve a compelling government interest, blah, 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 blah. So the Texas one had to change. It did not say that property tax-based funding schemes were unconstitutional. It did not change the ruling that the Constitution did not guarantee a right to education. All it said was this specific funding scheme in Texas had some problems that needed to be worked out. So I do want to give that context there. But for our purposes, the ruling in San Antonio still stood. The, the Rodriguez decision still stood. And then this was our reality. For years and years and years, this was our reality. The people continued to push back on the ruling in San Antonio for years. And again, eventually the Texas regime was eventually challenged, but Texas still funds their schools through property tax. It just had to be written differently. It's legal it's 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 legalese it's about how you write the law it's not about what the law actually does um it was pedantic <laughs> um and that's what the fights became and as we know from 1970 on we got a majority of our federal education policies coming through states were contending with the report and risk um, they were contending with No Child Left Behind. They were dealing with all of these new policies. Um, you know, there were even some ESEA amendments that came out after the Rodriguez decision. Our education policy system grew up after the Rodriguez decision, and it grew up in the context of the Rodriguez decision. So everything was built around the idea that as long as you're not raci directly racially discriminating against um, black people in education against brown people in education that was the system that we had so that leads us to fisher v texas this case is the most recent one we're going to talk about and it is the exact scope of what it said is still really trying to be figured out um but it was hugely important for our purposes when we're talking about the effects of the courts on equity in the classroom so Fisher v. UT, uh, UT Austin um, was uh, based off of a, another Texas law um, that required all Texas state universities, so every public university in the state of Texas, had to accept all students that graduated within the top 10% of their graduating class. I talked a little bit about my, um, my uh, late uncle, who was a superintendent. He talked about this. Um, he talked about how important this law is to Texas specifically because there are a lot of students that go to very small high schools that if compared to apples to apples to students who go to larger high schools with more resources, wouldn't be able to compete to be able to get in to these public universities. So because of this, the state of Texas said top 10% of every graduating class must get accepted into whatever public school they apply to. So this meant that if you graduated with 1,200 people, the top 120 were going to get in. But if you only graduated with 10, at least one student had guaranteed admittance into a public university. Huge deal. The rest of the admittance was left up to those universities specifically. So UT Austin, um, the biggest university in the, um, or the biggest single campus in the state of Texas, um, they created a, a formula for analyzing the rest of their students. And in um, the early 2000s, they said, you know what, we're not seeing the amount of diversity we want in our school, a student body. And so they created what was called the Personal Achievement Index, which was a number of different things that included race. Um, it essentially said, here are the other things that makes a student, you know, that, that treats a student holistically on why we would want them to be in our school. And part of that consideration was race. It's important to know that it was not just one checkbox that said, are they, are they white or are they not? It was part of a larger index that they used to uh, analyze students' acceptance. This was presented a problem for Abigail Fisher. Uh, Fisher. She was a graduating senior who was white and who was denied admission to UT Austin because she did not graduate within the top 10% of her class. Um, she applied to UT Austin, didn't get in, and challenged that she didn't get in because race was considered and because she was white, she did not get in. 
this is the reverse racism argument. This is about, um, uh, it, it is tangentially related to affirmative action, right? Giving preference to minorities to make up for traditionally, uh, to make up for um, historical discrimination. Um, Fisher said, uh-uh-uh, you're discriminated against me because I'm white, and that also violates the Equal Protection Clause. The university fought back, and they said, uh-uh-uh, no, what we're doing is we're trying to serve our own compelling government interest in increasing diversity by including race as part of a larger selective uh, selection of um, or, or a larger judgment of our students. Holistically, race was just one of the considerations. Um, they essentially said Abigail Fisher didn't get in, not because she was white, just because she wasn't a good candidate to get in. So the Supreme Court, remember, a significant amount of time has passed, since, especially since Brown, but even since uh, Rodriguez at this point. Um, the court looked dramatically different. There were no overlapping justices, so they had to contend with the idea of like, okay, what does the Equal Protection Clause actually mean when it comes to race-based policies? So remember, Rodriguez said if it's not talking about race directly, not something the Supreme Court should be involved with. This was talking about race directly. So the court said, okay, we know that based off of Rodriguez, we need to apply this strict scrutiny standard. It directly addressed race and education. Um, and they had talked about affirmative action a lot over the past two decades leading up to this. The court needed to determine whether or not a race-based scheme was necessary or whether or not it was d uh, implemented arbitrarily. So this essentially meant that what is the compelling government interest? Is there a compelling government interest? So it has to pass the strict scrutiny bar. But then it also they also had to say, would a non-race-based scheme achieve that same compelling government interest? It added another layer on top of this. So here's how it fell. Way more convoluted than even the ruling in Rodriguez. Um, it was a seven to one ruling. Kay didn't abstain because she, was, um, she had heard cases similar to this while she was a um, lower court judge in that area. Um, Justice Kennedy wrote that the race-based policy, A, did pass the strict scrutiny test, and that a diverse student body was a compelling government interest. The court didn't just allow all of these race-based schemes to go into effect, though. It essentially said that UT Austin's policy was written specifically enough to not violate the 14th Amendment. It was narrowly tailored to achieve that outcome. Um, I am not a legal scholar, not a lawyer, nor do I want to be. Um, this is a particularly hard case to digest because seven to one, you're like, wow, what a, what a uproaringly, uproariously popular, una almost unanimous decision. Um, it wasn't the case. The reason why it was seven to one is that most of the justices, or many of the justices, including Thomas and Scalia, essentially said, oh, well, the, the lower court should have used the strict scrutiny test, and they didn't. But they did write what were called concurring opinions, which are essentially like, we agree, but opinions, that said, hey, hey, yeah, strict scrutiny should be applied, but we shouldn't say that race matters. Like, the fact that Kennedy went on and said that race is a compelling, or diversity and admittance is a compelling government interest shouldn't have happened. But because they didn't apply strict scrutiny, we had to join the majority opinion. Convoluted. Absolutely. 100%. The impact of this, because of how convoluted it was, isn't particularly clear at this point. Yes, the, the court did say, yeah, diversity is something that we should, we should consider, but given that the court since 2013 has become more and more conservative, there are questions about whether or not a scheme like this would survive. We talked about stare decisis earlier. So traditionally, the court would just say, well, the ruling in Fisher 
it was final we're going to listen to it and other schemes that were narrowly tailored to achieve that diversity uh interest should survive as well however the supreme court has also recently started to say to quote um a podcast i like starry decisis is for suckers overturning roe v wade in such a uh, such a um strong fashion as they did in dobbs does call into question some of these other rulings especially the ones that had more nuance than something like brown did right um whether or not race would be considered is now up for debate this is a huge problem because if you are a university administrator and you do want to increase diversity you have to be concerned about considering race as one of your factors because if it does get challenged and brought all the way to the supreme court would the Supreme Court actually uphold it? Would the Supreme Court still agree with what it said less than 10 years ago? That's something that affects the behavior of administrators. It affects the behavior of policymakers. Policymakers may be a couple of different ways. They may be more inclined to further protect the, the role of diversity and uh, in our education systems through statutes and laws, or they may say, well, because we don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do, we're just not going to touch diversity issues. Um, the, the, the Supreme Court has a lot of power in affecting both what administrators do and the agendas and the actions of policymakers and lawmakers themselves. Because when you are not sure what the Supreme Court's going to say, it's going to make you more hesitant. You don't want to get caught up in a lengthy legal battle, especially one that goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And so... A ruling in something like Fisher does call into question a lot of the behavior and a lot of the actions that bureaucrats and policymakers can take going forward. Cool. Law class over. Let's uh, let's kind of wrap, put a bow on this, and I'll talk a little bit about why why this week is important to me. So, um, you know, since Brown, the courts have increasingly taken a less less a lesser and lesser role in protecting equity and education policy because of the diminishing role and increased diffusion about what the 14th Amendment actually means for education, it, um, it is incumbent upon policymakers to understand the court's influence and to protect equity through statutes and rules. It's also incumbent upon administrators to understand what court rulings mean for them so that they can make sure that they're acting in a way that is A, constitutional, and B, not going to get them caught up in a, law, in a lengthy legal battle. So when you're thinking about each of these rulings as you're reading them, um, and to emphasize, I do not want you to annotate and take detailed notes on these cases. I want you to have the experience of reading these cases, right? So when you're reading Brown, think about what made Brown so influential beyond just the end of segregation, beyond just overturning uh, Plessy. What else did it do and why was that important? And what effect do you think that Brown had on administrators and teachers? both in white schools, in black schools, in northern schools, and southern schools. How, how did that actually play out? What impacts could that have had? When you're reading Rodriguez, think about why Rodriguez was so important for education policy makers. Remember the confusion that existed. People just trying to figure out what integrated education meant. Rodriguez comes in and essentially says, yeah, we only mean racial segregation, right? And so what lessons did policymakers learn from Rodriguez and how did that affect our system going forward? Then when you're reading Fisher, think about how the courts truly see the role of equity in education. Given that Fisher also just recently happened, how would you recommend the policymakers respond? What should they do? Think realistically about this, right? You don't, you know, as much as we want to protect equity in education and we want to say, well, the, you know, we should just have a constitutional amendment to uh, protect the right to equal education, that's not gonna happen. And so think realistically about how policymakers could respond to something like Fisher, right? So this is the end of week 10. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about A, why this week is important and um, B, what, what the rest of this class will look like. So again, um, this week is important not because I want you to really dive deep into these important legal cases. This isn't law school. I don't care. What I want you to do is I want you to have the experience of reading Supreme Court decisions. 
as policy uh, policy analysts, as future policymakers, as future administrators, as current administrators, um, it is important for us to be able to read and understand court cases. These decisions have massive ramifications. You're going to have ramifications on everything from constitutional protections to the Administrative Procedures Act to um, the um, collective bargaining with your employees to land acquisition with governments everything everything falls into some sort of legal decision you're going to have to be able to read and understand what those are i want you to not get caught up in the legal ease there is going to be a lot of citation there's going to be a lot of well the court said this previously don't get too caught up think about it broadly reading court cases is hard but pull yourself out of the weeds and really think overall what is the rhetoric they're using and how is that rhetoric achieving a specific outcome that's the focus i want you to take when you're reading these these cases a are important for us to understand as education policy majors these are probably three of the biggest ones that that would come up in an education policy context but i also want you to have the experience of reading and kind of sifting through the lead to find what's important for us as policy makers so I'm calling this week a reading response light because, again, I do not want you to feel as though you need to delve deep into the legal minutia of these decisions. That's not what I want. I want you to think broadly about the effect that these rulings had on policymakers and on administrators and bureaucrats. That is the, the pedagogical reason. Um, next week's lecture i was going uh, i it's changed a bunch as i've developed the class initially it was going to be international education policy um read if you've um, looked ahead in abrams it talks a lot about international education policy and so i was going to draw that connection and with the makeup of this class as well as um kind of the direction that that you all have taken with your writings i didn't find that to be super compelling um, I'm instead going to talk about critical race theory, and I'm going to give you critical race theory from a true graduate school lens and give it to you as a tool. I was going to have a reading response due, you, but you all have worked really hard. You all have done very well, and I want you all to have the opportunity um, and the freedom to spend more time on your final project. There will be no reading response due next week. I will be posting a lecture and presentation it is optional of course i want you to read it of course i want you to watch the video but it is casual watch it on your own time does no reading response do work on your final project get me drafts if you want me to see them remember that is due on august 1st so we're coming up very quickly on that due date um for the rest of this class only a couple of weeks left um i want you to know what the process is it's going to be coming quick and because of um the nature of an online class we're not going to have a lot of in uh, a lot of interaction um with this so what will happen is that um next week will be an optional lecture um and then the following week is your final exam the final exam is going to be um a more structured prompt than the previous exam same spend two hours give yourself the time um again you should not be surprised by what the prompts are they've definitely been major themes um and so don't um don't be worried too much about it you all did really well on your midterms and so it's going to be a similar a similar approach i want you to to treat it as as your as your concluding thoughts on this class and on education policy overall um grades are due on august 8th i believe and so there will be no extensions for anything going forward um final project is due on the first um i will grade that um and get you detailed comments but those comments may come after grades are due i'll get you grades and your rubric and everything obviously before grades are due but i'll get you detailed comments because like i said i want you guys to have the experience of writing this and being able to use this if you do choose to go into some sort of policy analyst role i want you to have that experience and so i want to provide you that with that feedback even after the class has ended um final exam again i will grade post done um i also want you to know that there are extra credit there is extra credit that i have not included in your grades yet so do not be worried about your grades um i've talked to some of you 
none of you are going to fail my class. You've all worked hard. All of you are doing very well in my class. That is an outcome I want. Um, so um, that is another thing that's coming. So if you see your grades adjusting, that is likely what, what, it, what is happening. And then um, finally, please um, take the course survey when it is distributed. I'm actually not sure how it's distributed. For I'm sure it'll come via email. Please make sure you take the course survey. Please feel free to leave me any feedback on that course survey or set up time to talk with me. Send me an email. I want all of the feedback. I have done so much learning from you um, that I hope you're learning something from me as well. And any feedback you provide me is going to improve me as a teacher and improve my ability to make sure that that my courses in the future is, are as impactful and uh, as um, matter as much as they need to for your class in particular. So again, last lecture, I want to thank you all. I'll be posting probably the final message the final week because I get sentimental and cutesy. Um, but I want to thank you all for, for your hard work in this class. I've loved hearing your, um, you engage with this content. Um, it it makes, me, makes my heart very happy that, that you're engaging with this content um, so deeply and so thoughtfully in a way that when I was in grad school, I felt like no one else talked about education policy the, uh, in this way. And so it makes me very happy to see that um, you're engaging with it in this way. And I also want to thank you for all the feedback and everything you provided me. Um, Good luck on your final project. Good luck on your final exam. I know you're all going to do great. So thank you all, and you have a good rest of your week.